That's You're being talked about, right. Mike. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Never mind. Do we have water? We got water. We're good. Okay. We'll now call this uh, special workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council in order. You have a copy of the agenda for tonight. It's uh, got those two items on there. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adopt that agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Dr. Wood. Mayor, members of council, thank you very much for coming in at 4 o'clock today as we have the volunteer supper later this evening. What we'd like to accomplish in the next hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes are the three items that are shown on the screen. The first item, which is the MPO, is not just an update, but it also is part of your capital improvement program. And as we go through the cybersecurity issue with Chris and the capital improvements with Wally and the MPO with Anthony, we want you to feel free to answer or to ask plenty of questions because this is part of the overall budget. At this time, I'd like to ask Anthony, though, to kick us off with an update on the MPO. Please. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, Richard's given me 15 minutes, so Mr. Bittner, you'll have to hold me to that. <laughs> You're on. Yes, sir. Um, time is short, so we'll just jump right in. Interstate connectivity, you probably read an article in the newspaper not too long ago that said, Interstate coming to Jacksonville very soon. <laughs> um, great article, by the way, but uh, I'm not sure if I would have used those exact words. Uh, regardless, this is one of the things that the MPO is starting to talk about. You know, not only do we talk about micro, you know, micro level projects like widening this intersection, build a turn lane here, that kind of stuff, but we also talk about more regional initiatives like how do we get an interstate to Jacksonville? So just a couple of factoids here, and I know that uh, our TAC members have heard these before, but I think it really helps to drive home the point. Jacksonville is the largest city in North Carolina that does not have direct access to the interstate highway system. Camp Lejeune is the largest military installation in the country with that same issue. And when you start to think about the purpose of the interstate highway, first of all being for strategic military defense, and then second of all being for economic development, really start to see why we're beginning discussions on this. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not something that's going to happen in five years, 10 years, maybe even 20 years, but it might be a 30, 40 year journey that has to start somewhere. And that's what we're hoping to do now is to begin the community discussion on this particular initiative. The challenge that we face is that we've talked about this many times in the past, not in the context of the city council or the county commission, but as the MPO and, you know, tangential conversations. And there are equally as many solutions as there are conversations about this particular initiative. Uh, I think the consensus is, is that it's a great idea. And for those specific facts, you know, it's something that we would like to continue to pursue into the future. However, we got to figure out which one best suits our needs because it's not practical to think that we're going to be able to implement all of these. So here is a, uh, uh, an outreach plan that I presented to the TAC a couple months ago. And this just gives you an idea of where we're headed. First of all, we want to evaluate all of those options that I showed on the screen. You know, some of them have more merit than others. There are pros and cons to each one of them. But once we have those facts together, then we'll be able to begin the community discussion on, first of all, is this something that we want to pursue? I think in general, you'll find that you know, even though it's a long range vision, long range goal, something that people are interested in talking about. Uh, beginning the outreach, we would like to do that at, at some point with both the council and the county commission very likely at one of the joint sessions that you have in the future. Uh, once we have that conversation, then we'll start to bring in other stakeholders from the community, business holders, or excuse me, business owners, economic development, et cetera. The goal, of course, is to get to local consensus on one or more of those alternatives. I'm not sure if we'll meet that deadline, say in fall and winter of 18, but you know, again, the main thing is we're starting the conversation with the ultimate goal of 
developing local consensus, and then moving forward to regional engagement. This is an issue that's not going to be overcome within the confines of Jacksonville or Onslow County. And so that's why we feel that it's important for us to develop local consensus before we start to talk to our neighbors about the alternatives that, that we see best fit our needs. Moving on, prioritization five, we'll give you an update on this every time I, I come to speak with the council. Last time we were talking about scoring projects, DOT was in the process there. Um, since then, we've taken the next step. We have all the project scores, and now we're in the process of prioritizing the projects, giving DOT the local input that's necessary to, to begin populating projects on the transportation improvement program. So you remember, for two of the three levels of DOT funding, there's a data-driven piece of the decision-making. That's what we received in the project scores earlier this month. And then there's also the public involvement piece or the local input piece. And that's what we feed back as an MPO to DOT to help complete that decision making process. The goal, the end goal, of course, is to add to the existing $300 million worth of investment that's on the transportation improvement program today. To complete prioritization, we, of course, want to seek public uh, feedback. We do that through an online survey. We do it through other means as well, speaking to Amanda and her counterparts with the media, getting the word out, uh, holding uh, input sessions locally. Generally, they're at the Center for Public Safety, and then going in and speaking to various groups uh, in the community. But the main thing I want to point out is, even though the TAC is the uh, ultimate authority on what those priorities are, uh, we do want to spend some time with the city council and the county commission so that the TAC members are making informed decisions when, it, when we actually get to that point. And that's nothing new. That's something we've done with every single one of the prioritization cycles to date. Good news is, and I mentioned the three different levels of funding, right? You've got the statewide level at the top, you've got the regional level, and then the division level at the bottom, the three funding pots, okay? Two of those pots require the public involvement, the local input that I spoke of before. One of them does not. The highest level, the statewide level, is strictly data driven. So because we have the scores from DOT, we've already been able to program projects at that level for funding and implementation. Okay? It isn't common that we get projects funded at that level, but in this case, we were able to add one to the tip. And this is at the uh, intersection of McDaniel Drive and Workshop Lane. Of course, at the intersection of Marine Boulevard, as you see. Right now, we struggle with some capacity issues. We also have some ADA accessibility challenges. Uh, we found when we paved this section of the roadway, me, when we paved this section of the roadway down in here, that there's an issue or several issues with the existing culvert. It's actually given way and we have sinkholes developing. So this project comes at a great time. Not only do we need capacity improvements, but we also need to do some maintenance out there. In the process, like I said, we're going to install crosswalks, ADA accommodations and the like. So this is a brand new project that was not on the tip before that has been added and it's roughly $2 million of additional investment. You can see that we're going to do some improvements over there on McDaniel, and that ties back to an existing project that we're working on, which is the Trade Street Extension. So you probably recall that we've talked about this several times in the past, and the intent of this project is to build a connector road from Western at Trade Street, you know, the, the Hardee's Walmart area, behind the old Walmart back to McDaniel. There are challenges associated with this, but we're working very diligently to overcome them. The project at this point is within budget and it is moving forward. The reason that I bring this up is because you can see that the new project that I just referenced intersects with the project that's underway. So it's very likely that we're going to pair those two together. And going back even further in history, you'll remember that the Trade Street project was a relatively high priority for us because it gave us the ability to kind of avoid that interchange construction at Marina Western. We talked about it several years ago. It's going to be $85 million 
two thirds of that was going to be right of way acquisition. Doing improvements like Trade Street and McDaniel, uh, the Jacksonville by or excuse me Jacksonville Parkway improvements that we've talked about at the Jacksonville Parkway interchange, plus Commerce Road. All of that helps to alleviate pressure at Marine and Western, so that we don't have to build that really inv invasive interchange. Other pending projects, these are projects that are moving forward very quickly towards actual construction. Western at Gum Branch, that will be under construction this year. They're going to let the project within the next 60 days. Uh, I believe it's a 12 months, uh, 12 month construction period. So that one's off and moving. Uh, Marine at Gum Branch and Belfort, that's along a similar time frame. I think it's just a few months behind. Western at Gateway North and South. We hope that that'll be under construction the beginning of next year. And then uh, 258 Super Street, we've talked about this before. Um, they're in the process of acquiring right of way, but the challenge out here is similar to the challenges that we faced on Piney Green Road. And the fact that you've got a whole bunch of very small parcels that line the roadway so that you have to negotiate with each one of those individual pro property owners as they're acquiring the easements and things necessary to build the roadway. So it's dragging out that project, but we do hope that it's under construction late 2019. In a few minutes, you're going to see a slide like this in Wally's presentation. And we've touched on this several times. The fact that even though these are DOT projects, uh, there will likely be some city obligation associated with them. And it's, it's connected to the relocation of utilities. Okay, So the question is why? It's a DOT project. They're impacting our utilities. Why is it that we have to contribute our money to moving them? Well, the answer is relatively straightforward. General statute basically establishes who's, who pays for what and when. Okay, So we're going to address this in two different ways. First one is we'll talk about what DOT pays for, and then we'll flip sides and we'll talk about what municipalities pay for. So DOT pays for the relocation of utilities for small municipalities, uh, nonprofit corporations, water and sewer corporations, water and sewer authorities, such as on Wassa, rural county systems, and you won't find this language right here in the general statute, but legal precedent basically identifies that if, if you have a pre-existing right, meaning, for instance, uh, we went in and bought an easement that was outside of the DOT right-of-way okay, to put our water or sewer infrastructure, and then DOT with a project encroached into that easement, then they are obligated to pay for the relocation yeah. cost because we did already have that pre-existing right to the property. And John, please correct me if I'm wrong, or Wally, we've, we've all been involved in these conversations of straightening out the legalese around this. So those are the scenarios in which DOT will pay to relocate uh, water and or sewer utilities, okay? Other side of the coin is the municipality pays, okay? And you can see that it's a sliding scale based upon the size of the municipality. Of course, we're in the top tier there. So we have the pleasure of paying 100% of the relocation cost. Whereas other municipalities, you know, the smaller you are, 25, 50%, etc. So the next question, of course, is what are we doing about it? A $2.8 million outlay, like is shown on the screen there, that's a lot of money particularly given the fact that it was an unanticipated need. It would have been a lot different if we would have seen this project coming for 10 years and could have put money in the CIP over a series of time to help come up with the amount of money needed to do the relocates. Uh, so what we're doing, we're doing two things with DAT right now to try to overcome this. First and foremost, we're doing all of our deed research on where do we have pre-existing rights? Because that's critical. If we have pre-existing rights, DOT pays, right? The other thing that we're doing is what I call avoidance and minimization. So we're negotiating with DOT on the particulars of each individual project to either avoid the utilities that are in place 
and if we can avoid them, to minimize the impact. Okay? So those are the two things that we're doing right now. The 2.8 million that you see on the screen right here, if I remember correctly, is kind of a worst case scenario. This is before we do any of the deed research and do avoidance and minimization. We started this process with DOT. We actually started it last week. And I think we're going to be very successful in bringing very large numbers like this down to much more reasonable amounts. Can you describe the uh, situation or the scenarios that actually make it required that we move the stuff, that we move the utilities? I mean, sure. Well, I'll give you an example of where we've decided not to, meet, to move utilities, but DOT wanted us to, okay? Um, Western Boulevard, the old section of Western between 17 and 24, we have an existing sewer line out there that's about 16 feet underneath the existing travel surface. And correct me if I'm wrong, Wally. Um, we feel that it's in good shape, okay? We feel that it's far enough below the surface that it's not going to be impacted by the road work. DOT wanted us to move it, but we asked if we could leave it in place, okay? So conflicts like um, is the roadway going to be over the utilities? Typically, they want DOT wants them to be outside of the right-of-way. Is there a conflict with new stormwater infrastructure? Because we have to drain the road, the road's moving, so that typically gets into the areas where our water and sewer lines are. There's a whole slew of different situations, but those are typically... But again, you know, what I mentioned with the sewer line, that's part of the minimization or the avoidance. We feel that the sewer line is, is in good shape where it is. There's no reason for us to dig up a 16-foot deep sewer line to move it a few feet. So that's one of the areas we were able to work with DOT on leaving it in place. But to answer your question a little further, depending on the type of pipe that's in the ground and also the amount of cover between the roadbed and the top of the pipe itself, and as Anthony said, conflicts with what they're going to, they meaning the DOT, will be putting in in the way of storm drain systems. All of those, if you remember on Hargett, we had a significant amount of work, and also on Henderson, which uh, Anthony's briefed to you on before, this coming year we're going to be doing a lot of, of relocating the water lines. The sewer lines there, though, because of the depth and the fact we're going to slip line them, the DOT said, fine, we'll leave those where they are, but all of your water lines, because of age and depth, you're going to have to relocate. It's about making common sense decisions on the condition and the location, and DOT is being really good in, in working with us, with, working with us on those. So I'm, I'm past my time here, but I'll, I'll pick up the pace. Good news on the multimodal center: we received a 4.5 million dollar discretionary grant from DOT last week. That fully fund, I'm sorry, FTA. from FTA. Uh, that fully funds the remaining federal balance of the project, and we feel that it's to a point that we actually should have enough money to build the thing. Last time we were together, I showed you a funding strategy that looked like this. It had obligation from the federal side, the state side, and of course our side. It was based upon a feasibility study. It was basically a 30,000 level, 30,000 foot level um, uh, estimation of cost working with our architect and also getting feedback from other transit agencies who have built similar facilities recently, we were able to further calibrate that estimate and we feel that what's on the screen is a lot more reasonable. With the four and a half million dollars, with an additional couple hundred thousand dollars that we were able to get from DOT last week, we feel that the project is fully funded at 8.3. And again, the good news, something that we've been talking about all along, is that it appears at this point, if everything holds, the city's obligation to actually construct the project would be nothing more than the value of the land. And also, just a, uh, you know, Anthony shows you the timeline, just a quick reminder, this will house our transit, the Greyhound facility, the um, Amtrak facility, also be open to taxis, so it'll be one center. And also, outs will also be operating from there. That's why the building is a fairly large building. It'll also be a trailhead for the rails to trails, which we don't currently have. So and bathrooms and rest areas. Again, multimodal. That's the key to that facility. 
can see the timeline here. We're beginning the design with our architect. We feel very comfortable with him. Uh, the rest of the timeline here is subject to, so to, to change. Of course, we don't have the facility designed, so as we move forward, we'll be able to further pinpoint those dates. But this is what you will see in the capital improvement program. Park and ride is still under construction. We're moving along, even though the weather isn't cooperating. Um, you probably, if you've been out there lately, you've seen the form boards up for the curb and gutter. You've also seen them working on uh, Commons Drive South. Timeline, we originally wanted the project to be done in May for the Jamboree, but because of weather and other delays, that's just simply not going to happen. The good news is, is that we have a good rapport with the contractor and he's going to make the facility available for parking during the Jamboree. Now, for those of you in the construction business, Mr. Warden, that's very unusual for a contractor to be willing to do something like that, to open up their job site for public use before it is complete. It just shows you that we have a really good rapport with the contractor, and it's going to be a great amenity for the, for the Jamboree, whether it's paved or not. Project will be done in June. Last thing I want to I want to highlight for you here, moving into the budget discussions, and we've talked about partnerships a lot lately. And we've talked about all of these on the screen at one point in time. Uh, you probably noticed that there is a DI form in the current budget proposal. Uh, I believe this is one of the, the issues that that Dr. Woodruff is recommending for approval. But the reason that we're asking for the uh, reclassification of a temporary employee to a permanent employee is so that we can continue to explore and expand on these partnerships. We've had success in the past and we anticipate having success in the future. The good thing about these partnerships and what we're requesting is that we feel that the revenue these partnerships will generate will offset the cost associated with the uh, personnel request. I have more than expired my time, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the update. <clears throat> yes, sir. Excellent presentation, particularly about the good news about the multimodal center. Uh, something small. Yes, in sir. The, in the pale of these developments. It always, when you were talking about McDaniel Drive. Okay. Let's change the name of that street. <laughs> <laughs> It was named by, renamed by a city council. I, I even forget what it was before then, but for a nursing home, and the McDaniel has no longer around here and has probably changed ownership two or three times. And So it was named for something that was never built over there? Well, it was built. Oh, it was built. It's still there, yeah. just renamed. I could think of Warrior Drive or something like that, but somebody could come up with a name. Yes, sir. That would be a follow-up. Mayor. Just a quick question on the modal, multimodal facility. Yes, sir. Um, operating cost of that. We're calculating that now uh, based upon the estimates that we or the feedback that we've gotten from other systems. It appears that it's going to be about $80,000 a year simply for operating. And, of course, our federal grants will pay a lion's share of that cost. Will there be any kind of cost uh, to the private carriers that use that facility? We do hope to generate revenue off of those private carriers. So, for instance, Greyhound, they're interested in having a ticketing office there. So whatever revenue they generate off of selling tickets, we'll get a cut of it. And that cut will allow, will allow us to, well, let me say it differently. That cut will be local match that we can then use to leverage federal money to pay for the operating cost. And, and, and if OUTS operates in their OUTS, receive some federal funding, mm -hmm. and so their federal funding could help offset, offset, you know, pay like a rental cost in that. It's something we are looking at, but of course we won't know more until the building is actually designed. Will there be personnel costs associated with that? Are we going to have to staff it? Well, we're moving of... existing personnel in. That's the okay. good thing. Okay. So we'll be moving in OUTS. Uh, as well as Jacksonville Transit. Probably some of our other transportation staff will go over there. So the, admi the admin support and the front desk support that we currently have will just move over there. Okay. So really we're trying to make this as much of a win-win-win as possible. Okay. And it's going to be a very nice facility when it's done. 
Any other questions? Thanks, Anthony. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, Anthony, I'd like for you to take this dollar because Gail Maids bet me you could not finish this in 15 minutes. So <laughs> deliver, <laughs> deliver that dollar to, to Gail. Deliver this dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Sorry, I blew your. Uh, I wanted part of that. That's my allowance for the week. Well, uh, it's just the way it works. Easy come, easy you can take that. Out. That's exactly right. Good job. Thanks. Long. Mr. Bittner, uh, several years ago you asked that question and we looked into renaming and we'll pull back out of the file. If I remember correctly, it wasn't uh, a major issue because there were only one or two addresses that would have to be changed, but we will look at that. Chris, I believe Chris is up next. The budget workshops, as you know, we began last week and today we're uh, getting into some of the detailed issues. Uh, one of the ones that we want to spend some time with you on is the cybersecurity issue. Uh, this is not a local issue, it's a nationwide issue. Whereas most nationwide issues are handled at some other level, this is an issue that is handled at every level of government and every level of business. So Chris and Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you all. Jonathan, are you going to join also? I'll step back if you'd like. Okay. Gentlemen, turn it over to y'all. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council. Uh, so today we we meet to uh, talk about cybersecurity and uh, what is cybersecurity? Uh, cyber computer security uh, protects the computer systems, uh, protects from data theft, um, data damage, uh, service disruptions, um, loss of revenues. Um, you know, it can also damage the hardware, software, and basically our infrastructure that we have in the city. Uh, why are we talking about it? Why cybersecurity, um, you know, is important enough to uh, address the council about? Uh, in October 2017, Catawba County experienced uh, theft of personal information. Basically, all their personal data has been compromised, taken out, and they uh, they sent thousands of letters, and uh, as a matter of fact, I, I used to work there. I received one of those letters that offers me a, 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 a basically identity theft protection for a certain period of time. November 2017, Brunswick County, day before uh, Thanksgiving, their entire system, including their phones, uh, everything was affected. Uh, IT staff uh, reach out. Uh, for help outside to uh, to the state, Nekojiza. Uh, they worked through entire uh, Thanksgiving holiday. They uh, took them close to a week to restore critical services, and afterwards, of course, they mediated uh, other services. December 2017, Mecklenburg County, that, that attack took um, basically a majority of system in Mecklenburg County for over two months. Um, the uh, county manager came out and talked about ransom and Mecklenburg County not uh, willing to negotiate or pay the ransom. Uh, later, Davidson County, February 2018, uh, Friday, uh, close to 1 o'clock in the morning, 911 contacted CIO and basically told them that uh, computer files are encrypted. Um, they uh, responded to uh, to attack uh, 80 servers. Most of their systems were, were basically paralyzed. Their data is encrypted. They cannot use it. 911 center functionality, CAD, computer uh, aided dispatch, was restored uh, several days later on Monday afternoon. They decided to basically use pen and pencil for four days before 911 operation came came back to normal. Um, their county systems um, several weeks later all have been restored. Those are just a few examples. You know, some of you may have heard about Delta data breach. Uh, Sears, what are the consequences? Um, the data is held for ransom. Hackers basically want money to uh, pay for their um, illegal operation. Uh, disrupts the services, you know. Um, uh, there's a lot of things. Um, um, relying on the computer systems. Data is stolen. Now, when somebody steals the data and sells it on the um, basically dark web, um, 
you know, personal identity, as, as we know, that's a, that's, a, that's a big thing. And of course, loss of revenue. Those are just a couple of things that IT facilitates. We uh, help uh, facilitate 123,000 uh, 911 calls uh, per year. Uh, daily, city of Jacksonville receives uh, anywhere between 15 to 20,000 emails. Out of those emails, 92 percent, now keep in mind, 92 is a big number, only 8 percent passes the IT filtering system that are legitimate emails. Other emails are known as um, emails that originated from uh, sources that have been identified as malware, uh, as sending spyware, as, as basically originating from sites that are known for uh, hackers' activities. City collects $23 million in water and sewer <coughs> charges. Um, IT became integral and uh, basically a necessity for uh, city operation. So how do we do that? Uh, several months ago, uh, we came here to address the council of our overall, uh, Anton used a uh, uh, saying, 30 feet uh, approach. We have uh, two data centers. That's 30,000 foot approach. That's right. That's right. That's right. I wonder if you had a dollar for my 15 minutes. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have two data centers that basically work at the same time. If at any time uh, one of those data centers would experience, you know, disruption, let's say fail of electricity, there's a fire, there's a flood. The other data center would basically pick up the load and uh, serv city services should not be affected. Okay, but what if we have a large event, something like hurricane, and take down both of them uh, offline? We said that we're addressing that issue by bu building our disaster recovery site. Disaster recovery will have a full network uh, capacity, will have uh, compute storage. Uh, we were in advanced stages of uh, uh, designing that space in town of Cary. They already agreed for us to put uh, two computer cabinets. Uh, we'll have our own uh, power supply and our UPS. Uh, we also, what happens when, when you're attacked? You basically have two approaches. You can pay the ransom and hope that there's some dignity on the other side, which there's not. <laughs> And um, they may or may not decrypt the files, um, or you may delete the files and restore the backup. But in order for us to retrieve the backup and restore the backup, we have to have it. So we have local backup in Jacksonville, and then we replicate that backup to identical device in town of Cary, where that would be our secondary um, uh, approach to data recovery. So what do we do? What are our tools to protect the city um, from um, hackers? And let me just add one, one thing. Hackers have been, for years, active. It used to be a, a, a kind of a thing of the pride. I can hack into that system and maybe create some damage. Nowadays, it's way more advanced. The governments are involved in uh, hacking activity. It's basically a modern warfare. And recently, FBI posted an article that um, government agencies, schools, and healthcare are mainly targeted, targeted by uh, organized, those are agencies, those are not single hackers working off of mama's basement. Um, we use firewalls, real-time threat protection, advanced malware protection, virus protection, we filter. Um, I, I don't want to read the whole slide, but uh, awareness, we train our users. We have tools that we can send out emails to city employees and see how they react. If they click on the attachments that should not be um, open, we can basically identify those employees and offer them additional training additional uh, increased awareness. So we, we've done quite a bit of it. We also um, develop policies and procedures that basically tell employees of what they can, what they cannot do. But 
after all those tools, mm -hmm. every employee has a login and password. That login and password is like the key to the system. That means that we trust that employee to the files that are stored on the network. And that's, that's the weakest link of our system. We, we need to train. We need to educate. We need to bring the awareness. We set up policies and procedures. And we hope that in, in the event, if we would be compromised, and um, I showed examples of local North Carolina governments that have been um, uh, a compromise. We need to have a good plan of recovery. We need to have a strong backup. We need to have a process. We also have to have a communication with other departments, our um, uh, customers, to have a business continuity plan. What if you come to work and your computer system is not operational? Do you have a plan to conduct the business? Um, current staffing. We have two in GIS. We have three, uh, two, two people. There's an error here. Two on the help desk. We have six on the client server and application team. Two on network team and one on SCADA uh, administrator. We um, currently do cybersecurity by basically everybody on the team has a shared responsibility. So we all work on making sure that the servers have latest, greatest patches updated, uh, that if they see anything that's unsafe, any type of activity, they report it to the team and we take a team approach. There's no one person fully responsible for so cybersecurity. Yes, there is. You. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. I have a couple other duties and yes. sign invoices yes. and <laughs> have to talk to my boss. Uh, so what, what well, we do. You did notice he didn't point to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know better. Yeah. Uh, so current stuff is reactive. Uh, we do um, a lot of implementation, we do troubleshooting, we do uh, cybersecurity on a part-time basis. What we're asking is a ded dedicated cybersecurity person that's basically going to review the logs, review the tools that we have, make sure that we are all doing, um, you know, all our holes are basically patched. Um, he also does on a, on a uh, dedicated basis uh, user education. Um, and that uh, really pretty much conducts my uh, presentation. I will open the floor to any questions that you may have. All those um, various counties and entities you showed on the map there, do you get like a, a report back of where the, the weakness was or is there a identification at all is it or it's just a mystery after after it's over so uh, no I, I, neither one of those uh, is, is exactly what happened so every single situation is a so consider a crime site so there's FBI involved there's uh, state agencies involved and they do con investigation during the investigation and after after the investigation which is a lengthy process uh, some of the information is not available uh, you cannot uh, just, you know, pull a report of what exactly happened. But in a profession, yes, we do uh, share uh, lessons learned. And uh, most of the time when I talk to my peers, I hear that make sure you've got all your servers, latest patches applied. Make sure you have a strong backup. Right now, we're talking about the backup that is not connected to the network. So what if somebody gets in on our network and tries to destroy the backup first? Uh, you know, h hackers are not uh, using the same tools every day. That's constantly changing process. So if they uh, come up with a good a way of uh, compromising somebody's system, we've got a device that protects us from that. But what if that hack is developed today? It's called a zero day or first day attack. Our devices are not, cannot predict the future. Don't know what's going to happen today. And if we're the first one hacked, then we have to have a reactive plan to what to do if we are going to be compromised. And that's where the planning, that's where the procedures come to play. What's the... Uh 
I'm in agreement with your idea for a cybersecurity specialist. But what's the protection against vesting or vesting control with one person? What's the what's the safeguards against that? We we don't work as a single players. We work as a team. That person would work with the rest of the team would work with Adam, Adam here currently um, a network manager oversees uh, most of the security appliances. Um, I think if I understand your question is, will this person possibly create a single source of failure? Am I correct? Could be. Um, we we be work as a team. That, that person will work with the rest of the team, so I'm not, not, not concerned about it. So he wouldn't have, he or she wouldn't have carte blanche authority over the system. Correct. Even what's I, the, even I don't have logins to everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stuff makes sure that I only have access to things that I need to do my job. High information. What's the difference between malware and viruses? I'll let Adam uh, do his part. Um, so a, a virus is something that sits on your computer um, and for whatever reason, I mean, it may be um, there to just um, disrupt your machine, make it slow, that kind of stuff. Malware more is looking for what are you doing? Like some malware is, is not um, malicious in any, any way. It just wants to know what are you doing for marketing purposes. Um, some of it is keylogger malware. So it's, 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 it's remembering what you're logging in so it can get your password later, that kind of stuff. Viruses are there to, to, to break your system. Malware is there to collect information. Okay. Let me... I presume, in terms of employees, uh, username and password, that's unique to each employee. Yes. Correct. And we also require it to be changed every 13 weeks, is it? It's 90 days. So we have procedures in place that require password to meet certain minimum requirements. So it has to have number of characters, has to have capital characters, has to have numbers, has to have special. On TV. They're, they're, that's also <laughs> dictated by PCI and DCI compliance that we have to have those in place also. In compliance with what? Uh, DCI, which is um, our, um, the way the police look up um, information. Vision, criminal information. Yeah, criminal information. Okay. PCI is our credit card of compliance. Okay. Since we accept credit cards, we have to meet certain standards. How long so before you have the uh, carry backup fully operation? What's your timeline on that? So we are about 80% completed with our uh, migration of data from uh, VNX storage to uh, VX Rail. It's a basically a system specific name of the systems that we use. Um, uh, after that is completed, we're going to build uh, a, a basically a standalone uh, two computer racks that are going to be transported to K. We estimate that time to be sometime uh, late May, early June. We hope that uh, that site will be operational by July. Before so early hurricane, hurricane season. That's correct. And, and in the meantime, we still back up data at Cary, but we're adding that operational capability right. to Cary. <laughs> Just remember that I warned everybody when you went from an abacus to a computer. <laughs> now, now, you were earlier in that. Remember the, the rock. You were doing the rock. You, you were a little suspicious of that abacus. <laughs> I hope, I hope we, didn't, we didn't create a, a feeling of fear. Uh, we, we try to stay on top of it. Uh, we, we have the, the tools in place. It just takes a dedication, and we feel that the current events or recent events across just the state of North Carolina indicate that more and more needs to be done in order to protect our data, protect our services. Just out of curiosity, I don't remember hearing you say this, but how many attacks have you detected as far as possible attacks? So possible attacks, um, we had three last year that were early detection and disrupted very small group, one from one computer and two that uh, small amount of data that was quickly restored and we were talking about few hours and only specific one department. 
Um, as how far as that, attempts a day, by, how was that determined? I didn't mean to cut you off. But. So how that was determined in one event, we did a present Adam and I went to meet with a group of employees and talk about what to look for. Several hours later, one of the employees called us and said, Hey, something that you talk about, I see on my computer, we were quickly able to, um, quarantine, remove the permissions for that login from our network. So the virus could not spread and restore that particular computer. And that was a success story because it was literally within a few hours we detected it. Uh, we had one that uh, took down about two folders full of files. Um, we were able to, again, do the same thing, stop that login from having any access to the network and then see what was encrypted, restore it. Uh, so two, uh, three, three last year, as far as at failed attempts, I would let Adam answer we that question. You see, <clears throat> there's a lot, a lot of false positives, um, but I, I would say we we investigate probably four to five a week of of things that look suspicious to us on on people's machines. Um, some weeks we might not have any, but then some weeks we may have four or five. Especially when it comes to holiday shopping, uh, we see a huge spike before Christmas. We see a huge spike before, you know, Thanksgiving and so on and so forth. Um, companies are sending a lot of malware, and, you know, there's a lot of activities on the network. And, and those what things happened? are those things are things that got through, not things that we actually blocked. I, I would say we're probably getting a hit every second on our firewall to see what's open, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, the, the, the attempts are there by the second, um, but things that actually get through, I, I would say, for a lot of the... What happened in Atlanta? Their, their system was compromised very similar to Mecklenburg County. Basically, um, uh, hackers use a phishing attack. They uh, send you an email to get your information, get you to log in to a false site, site that looks legitimate, you think you're logging into that organization, but you're actually giving your login and password, and they use that to encrypt their files, and their systems were down for extended period of time. But it's the uh, same thing, ransomware. Phishing scams are a very popular way of trying to get personal information. Is there anything that you could tell us and tell people who might watch this workshop what would be the best way to try to uh, avoid this type of attack? If you will receive an email with a link and with a phone number to call, don't trust that information. Go to a site, research that, and find out on yourself for yourself what's the email or what's the phone number or link to the bank or financial institution that you're doing business with. Um, don't open attachments unless you're 100% certain that the person that sends you that, that file uh, is the file that, you know, read the, the, the email address fully. If, if the address is supposed to be, you know, ccoltic at jacksonvillenc.gov, don't read the whole, whole name because we can buy a domain for literally a few dollars that looks almost the same, that may have one digit difference. And so be smart. Don't trust just because it's on the Internet it's true. Uh, I, I think researching things for yourself and being aware of the fact that there are people that are trying to get your information. Uh, the, 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 the most frequent thing that I see is people click on the link that was sent to them in the email, and just because it looks like a financial institution, institution website does not necessarily mean that it is. The other thing that, you know, when Chris and Adam and the, and the staff come around to all of the employees and give the training, they mention simple things, once again, like your email. My email address is, as you know, rwoodruff at jacksonvillenc.gov. A computer doesn't recognize that. It just recognizes digits. So if you get an email that says r.woodruff at jacksonvillenc.gov, you're probably just going to hit it because you think it's for me. It's not. And that's what that's the first thing that we that we teach employees. Look at the email sender. Look at the address rather that it is coming to and do you recognize that? 
let's say Chris is sending me an email. I look at that email address, and if I see anything unusual, let's say it says Chris Coltick instead of C. Coltick, anything like that, it's important. You know, you just can't assume anymore because once you click it, it doesn't take three or four hours for this stuff to work. What's the term, nanosecond? Yes. Yeah. Now, the other part, uh, you know, of this is remember, our systems are not just about employee information. We have 17,000 water billing <coughs> informations out there. And you know that when somebody signs up for water, we require a lot of name, rank, and serial number. So part of what we're asking in the budget this year, sure, it's an expensive position. You're not going to hire a person, you know, straight out of college for $30,000 to do this job. This is an expensive position. But it's one of those where, you know, you, I don't think that we have a lot of choice, unfortunately, in today's society. We have an obligation to protect <coughs> those 17,000 customers. We have an obligation to protect the revenue stream that comes in every month. If, if, the, if Sabrina Adams and the water billing system is taken down for ransom, it isn't about are we going to have to pay $20,000 to open it back up. It's about what else did they get in every one of our customers' names, social security <coughs> numbers, addresses, credit card information. <coughs> now, hiring this person doesn't mean it, there's no guarantee. It doesn't mean we won't have that dilemma. But the reason why we're recommending this in the budget this year is because we are seeing the reality of the situation nationwide. And as you noticed in one of the first in one of the first slides, it said everybody does it. Well, remember the old it's everybody's responsibility? What's the old saying? If it's everybody's responsibility, it's actually nobody's responsibility. And so what we're looking for is a person who will be the person whose job it is to protect us. These other people, and Mr. Bittner, you made a good point. We will not set up a system where this person becomes the only keeper of the institutional knowledge and nobody else can help because then that person could hold us for ransom I'm going to go to work someplace else unless you pay me half a million dollars, you know. So we have to make sure, and that was a very good point that you made. But uh, later in the budget, we will be asking you all to give us consensus as to whether you're comfortable adding this position. Now, in fairness, uh, Chris actually was 14 minutes. The discussion took a little longer. So, Gail, I don't think I owe you a dollar on this one. So. Good job, Adam. Good job, Chris. Wally? What's the wager on this one? Yeah. I, may, I may want part of the action. All bets, all bets are off. Yeah. All bets are off. The, light, the lights are off. The Vegas on this? Yeah. Where's the coffee? Let's so all start with the policy. Yeah. The I won't be 15 minutes. So just, and just remember, there's no ca no caffeine here, no coffee. So That's right. <laughs> And, and, and the other apology is I'm not Deanna. I know that she normally delivers this. She would do a much better job than I would. But unfortunately, she's in class tonight, so you're stuck with me. And again, I apologize. Um, with that, um, I do appreciate the opportunity to come talk about the Capital Improvement Program. Um, it is an, an important part of the budget process. Um, when Dr. Woodruff talks about a starting budget, in you know august september october this is where we start we start with the capital improvement plan um so tonight what i've done is because i recognize that i'm not 15 minutes long we have this broken up into a couple of sections so if at some point we get to a section and i've spoke too much or we need to move on to something else we can stop and come back so what i'm going to talk about tonight is just give you a brief overview um, 
for your benefit as well as the viewing public about what the capital improvement pl uh, plan is, what the projects make up. Um, Anthony kind of gave you a, a brief overview of the DOT projects and we'll show you how those are going to impact us in the next couple of years. Um, I'll talk about ongoing programs and then get into some of the current projects. I won't touch a lot on the current projects because I know that you've had um, project updates from Dan in the past, so and you um, and we do provide those more frequently. But if you have a question about a certain project that's up there, I'll be happy to talk about it. And then we'll get into the FY19 projects, and those are the ones that are really the most critical because those are the funding year. Um, those are what we will be looking to include into the budget. And then we'll talk about the future projects. So with that, I spent 15 minutes on the first slide. Um, a, a capital improvement project is basically a large, major investment, and it's, um, it's typically a project. It is not a piece of equipment. It's not a, a backhoe or a fire truck or a dump truck. It is actually a, a project. It is infrastructure or building or a parking lot or a street. Um, sidewalks, things like that. So are things that exceed $50,000 in cost, they have a useful life of more than five years, and they typically require 12 months or more to complete. Um, and typically what you'll design, you'll see is a, um, a process, you know, planning, design, or engineering, and then construction. So with that, the importance of the capital improvement plan is to basically plan out these major investments and show expenditures in the year that we expect to see them, and then to show the um, funding sources. Um, in, in many cases, it may be the water and sewer fund for water and sewer projects, or the stormwater fund, or for police or fire type projects, it'll be the general fund. So we have multiple funding sources, so we try to identify the funding source and then it helps us to evaluate, prioritize, and schedule those projects. Um, it also communicates uh, the ongoing projects that we have, the projects that we'll be rolling over, the new projects we plan to do, and then those projects we're planning for the future. Um, this year, we have the CLP is slightly different. I know we've talked about this uh, leading up to the capital improvement plan, but. The biggest change this year is we went from a five-year capital improvement plan to a 10-year capital improvement plan. And we did that primarily because of the system development fees. And we, since we were doing that for water and sewer projects, we decided we, we needed to go ahead and plan the same for parks and recreation, the community improvement pro, uh, projects, um, IT projects you'll see in there. There's some fiber connectivity. So we're actually looking at 10 years of projects, not just five years of projects. Um, again, the FY19, the first year, is the most important because that is the year we're funding. We're not funding all 10 years at one time, but they are important for planning purposes. Um, new this year, because of the impact we, are ha we have from the DOT projects, we have a separate tab in your book for the, uh, those projects. So they are grouped together. And then we changed, just a minor change, but we changed uh, sidewalk projects to pedestrian improvements. And really we did that because we were spending that money not just on sidewalks, but uh, we were making handicap ramp improvements, um, pedestrian crossing improvements. So we, we were trying to be more encompassing. Uh, that also includes trails or greenways if we were to use that money. So jumping into the projects, um, Anthony talked about the, the upcoming projects that we have. He mentioned this one, Western and Gateway. Um, you can see that uh, what it looks like DOT is going to be doing is, you know, expanding that in intersection, adding some lanes. But what that does is it adjusts the stormwater. It adjusts the grades. It increases the pavement, which has impacts to our water and sewer infrastructure. And you know, one of the things that Anthony alluded to is these are estimates. These estimates were giving, given to us by NCDOT. So what they do is as they're creating their design, 
they have a program that spits out where the conflicts are, and then they use their, esti their cost estimating software to provide us with a cost. Now, we plan to try to work with them to get these numbers down, only to the, do the relocations that we need to do, but this is what gives us our start. So over the projects that we currently have in the next two years, we have the Western Gateway widening, the widening of Gum Branch Road from um, Somersill out to uh, Richlands. And while you think that's outside of the city, what impact does that have on the city of Jacksonville? Well, we actually have one of our main water lines runs right under Gum Branch Road all the way to Rock Creek. So as you can imagine, as they're widening that section, that could have significant impact on our water system. Um, this is Western and Gum Branch. The, there we have lines in every leg of that intersection. So the, while we don't have a whole lot of sewer right at that area, the impact to our water is fairly significant. Um, this is the intersection of Marin and Gum Branch. Again, you know, they're doing intersection widening, but it is, you know, primarily water related conflicts. And we're looking about $216,000 there. And then Anthony touched on this one already. This is a super street concept. Um, and this is for 24, 258. And again, one of our, our major line, our major water line runs right out um, past power, almost all the way to Airport Road. Um, and that's a 16 inch water main. And while that cost is significant, we're hoping that we can get the cost of that project down some. Um, but with that, over the next two years, water and sewer is looking at roughly about $4 million worth of impact to our water and sewer system. And I, I think the, the important thing to point out is in most cases, these are not lines we would have been out there replacing anyway. And in most cases, these aren't complete line replacements. These are adjustments or replacing segments. So that doesn't mean that years from now, you know, sooner rather than later, we may not be talking about the same line again. So um, I, I think that's just a, an important feature and that's why we kind of created a section in your book. In addition, he also mentioned four or five projects that we don't even have estimates for. We know they're out there, but we don't have estimates for them yet. So, and I know a, a major one is the work that they're going to do, do down um, the length of Western Boulevard. And um, while he mentioned the sewer, the water under Western Boulevard is AC, or asbestos cement, which is fine as long as it's in operation. But if it dries out, it gets brittle. Um, it doesn't handle construction around it very well. Um, so that's another one that we're going to be facing pretty significant cost on. So those are, uh, and then the Commerce Drive extension. Um, this one is in 2020. So this is kind of the, the last one that I was, I want to mention tonight. Um, but with that, we also have some ongoing programs. And if you decide to follow along either on your I guess it's in the laptop on your device or in the book. I do have the page numbers, um, so I'll kind of flip along primarily to keep up with the page numbers. Um, before, but our, before you move along, what was yes, the sir. cost of the utility uh, relocation for Gum Branch Road? For Gum Branch, it was fairly small, and I don't know which pieces that are. Um, it's one hundred eight thousand is the estimate. Was that all? Okay. For now. And that's, but, and, and that's not a true widening. That's just that's just bits and pieces. That's right. The main widening is still at some point in the future. We're probably going to break it into two phases, but it's in the future where we actually go to a four-lane divided. Yes. Which would require relocating. Well, a relocation again. <laughs> yes. Significant, there, probably. Well, that raises there the question. I think that, if I recall, there's only one well out there that's that's involved in that line? No, we have um, by Rock Creek. 11 through 18 come through that line. Wells 11 through 18. Okay. So, um, 
We do have, and they go to, now what you're probably thinking of is we have Gum Branch Central that's right outside of Rock Creek. And Wells 11 through 18 go to Gum Branch Central, and from there they come into our system. Um, and it's got a 500,000 gallon clear well in it. You also now have so it's not it's not well feasible size. to abandon the line because it'd no, be sir. cheaper to build a new well. Okay, I understand. Correct. And and then the uh, what about the, uh, mm -hmm. the the new line through Burton Park? I mean, I guess hopefully you'll figure out some way during the design to mitigate possible impacts down the road on that. Mm -hmm. We actually that. worked with them on the intersection at, and we had we ha we adjusted our design to meet their concepts for that project. You're correct. So our ongoing programs, one of the things that we did a little bit differently is um, we grouped some of our projects. You know, every year we talk about the street rehab project. We have street rehabs every year. Um, so they, it's multiple projects that show up. So I figured what I do is I just lump those together and talk about those. Um, and same with sidewalk projects. So one of the first ones I'd like to point out is the well rehabilitation. This is found on pages 115 through 120 of your capital improvement plan. And if you're using the device, I apologize, don't go by the numbers at the bottom because they include the preface and you know the pie charts and all of those things. So you'll have to look at the sheets, the actual sheets on the uh, bottom of the page. But this is, um, a project designed to start rehabilitating some of our wells that we have. These are the Black Creek wells. Um, they were constructed in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, we are starting to, to see failures in a lot of those. Um, matter of fact, I think some of the uh, generators that are out there look like they're from the 60s and 70s. But um, it's a, this is projects that will be reoccurring, but they won't continue forever because we are limited. As I said, you know, we, I think we only have about 10 or 12 of these that we'll need to address. Um, but they are things that we're starting to have failures with. You know, a lot of them are structural failures. Some of them are pump failures. So these are um, basically rehab projects that we've programmed um, over the ne well, next several years. Figure. Um, the, we start having problems with the roof. Um, we've had some, matter of fact, our booster station, we had to put a new roof on because it started um, <laughs> leaking and, and falling in. And a lot of these have, some of the challenges we have is the way the wells were constructed. That's, the wells, that's not really a capital improvement, a roof. No, but what we do is we go in and get the rest of the structure while we're there also. So we don't put a new roof on a 60s building. Now, some of them are concrete block, and those are fine. Why wouldn't that um, be a capital improvement? If it's money, maybe. Yeah, because some of them are small. But in most cases... But it's still while, a capital improvement on, on that structure. It is, but most cases they would be... If it's a single roof, it would be under $50,000. But in a lot of these, we also have to do electrical upgrades and pump upgrades. Okay. Um, the I and I projects we have um, the way these are uh, put together. Um, we have design in one year and construction in the next year, so they're every two years. Um, we found that this method actually works very well. It gives us time to collect data, go out and um, make improvements. And typically, our capital, our, our in, uh, flow and infiltration projects are done by lining. Um, I know that you've heard us talk about that quite a bit. Basically, what we do is we put what looks like to be a big sock down the sewer pipe, and then we inflate it with either steam or hot water and it cures in place, and it, it essentially creates, creates a pipe inside of a pipe. Um, as Greg shared with you in the last um, sewer or wastewater update, we are not finding home runs anymore. We're, you know, we're essentially hitting singles for the baseball fans where we're you know, out there and we're finding things that we need to address, and this, it is ongoing maintenance. 
Um, but we're, you know, we're not finding the several hundred thousand gallon leaks or anything like that. Um, but this is something that reoccurs and you can find those on pages uh, 83 through 87. What you'll generally see there is that one year we'll put about 70,000 into studying and designing and the next year we'll put about 600,000 into actual work. That's correct. So it goes from designing to work, designing to work. Could, uh, could a large portion of the uh, infiltration or inflow be in people's yards? It's entirely possible. One of the things we do for um, in, in our lines maintenance section is um, every other summer we'll go through and do smoke testing. So we'll blow smoke into the sewer and a lot of times you'll find smoke coming up and you know we found it in people's gutters where their you know their gutter systems tied directly to their sewer line or we found missing clean outs. So it is possible to find some of those. Um, I know that we have in a particular area um, a frequent flyer that will go out and put a clean out cap and it just happens to be a low area in the yard and you go by after a large rain event and the, all of a sudden the clean out cap's missing. So, you know, we, we do have those situations. I just wondering how much was on the private side that you weren't, weren't able to, to, to do any testing on well the, the biggest one that and we'll we'll touch on this but the biggest one that we know of is holiday city mobile home park you know that that one right. we have studied um and um the new owners have done a very good job of working with us and they've actually commissioned their own private firm to come in and look at um and study that system and see if they can find some of the problems Our ongoing water and sewer rehab projects, um, example of these are page 104, 110, and 114. Um, and essentially, these are uh, water and sewer projects where we have um, ongoing maintenance. You know, it's, it's pretty evident by driving down the street and you see a utility cut, you know, every couple hundred feet because we're having problems with that line. So these are prioritized based on um, the history of maintenance with utility maintenance. Um, sometimes it's the type of pipe. Um, you know, we, we find that we have a lot of problem with thin wall PVC for water line. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's things in the area have changed over time and, and we have problems. So these would be, um, you know, named after either a street, you know, be, you know, one we did was uh, Thompson School. We did a water line replacement. So those are just examples of this ongoing program. And again, these come from um, either things we find with our street rehabilitation project, um, because we do look at utility infrastructure, um, or things that we find from utility maintenance as ongoing problems. And then our pedestrian improvements, which was formerly our sidewalk program, we put generally about $100,000 a year into this. Um, it is Powell Bill funded, so these would be Powell Bill eligible projects. And these are on pages 61 through 70. Um, and again, the, the purpose is to install sidewalks where we need them. We coordinate a lot with the MPO on where we need to install sidewalks. Um, we actually work with the MPO in the, on the transit side because if it's in the general vicinity of bus stop, we can use transit funds for that. Um, more recently, we've been talking with Lily in the Office of Liberal Neighborhoods because she can use some money for sidewalks in certain areas. So we are trying to stretch this money as far as we can um, and in correlating those three. Um, and again, the, the general purpose always makes me nervous when it blinks. Um, the, and the general thing here is we are trying to focus on creating circuits and connectivity. And then our street rehabilitation. Um, this year we'll have about $830,000 in street rehab. Um, I don't have the list of streets for you now. I don't believe it was in the book. 
um, but we have been meeting and looking at the utilities in preparation, and we have multiple streets that we'll be looking at that we'll come back to you and, and share those streets with you. Also, you will recall that one of your budget notes, it was budget note eight from our first meeting, you asked how we could possibly improve the amount of money, increase the amount of money going into street paving. Uh, one note, if you will recall, when the uh, intelligent transportation system connecting all of our uh, traffic lights together, uh, we were not clear on what we were supposed to fund. And because of that, we found that uh, after the project was over, the DOT was asking about $4 million back. So in doing the research, Gail pointed out that this is the last year that we will make that $500,000 payment to the DOT. 19, you mean? Yes, in FY19. 19, 19. Uh, this in July, July this is the budget last. payment. Yeah. For the, yeah. It's about $2 million the last requirement. Month. Yeah. Of the, what we're paying back is about $2 million. Yeah. So the 500000 that will be in the 19 budget, that will be the last time we have to use that money to pay them back. That doesn't even, again, while, it, while you add 500000 to 800000 it increases it substantially. It still is an underfunded program. Go ahead. And, and we have, um, in recent years, changed our philosophy. You know, we're doing less of the full rebuild of streets. Um, and we are doing more mill overlay, trying to stretch those dollars, focusing on the um, mid-level streets to make sure they don't drop into a failure category and bring those up. But we are going in and trying to pick up some of those failing streets yeah. where we can and bring those back did, up. Did, did, did you notice any... Anything in regard to the, the severe winter, did it? Did Absolutely. It, I mean, well, I know that, but I mean, <laughs> did it, have you noticed that it hit uh, A streets worse, B streets, did it matter, D streets, did it, how about some that you'd milled and redone, did it hit any of those? I mean, is there something that we the, can improve on there? I don't know that we looked at a holistic like that, did it impact this segment of streets worse than, but there are, some that, I mean, it just, it just severely, it, Carolina Force is a primary example. I mean, it really hurt Carolina Force. And we were looking at one today, Dixie Trail, the connection from 17 into Hyatt Circle. It really hurt that street, too. Matter of fact, that one's one that wasn't originally on our radar for this upcoming year that I think will probably be on our radar because of that. So there are some that we've really identified that have been hit hard. Is, is putting uh, mixing concrete in when you mill and then mix concrete in with the, the subsurface that you're compacting back, is it, how expensive is that? That is what we were doing, um, and it is expensive. One of the challenges that we've found is if you don't do it exactly, either way you end up with block cracking. So oh, your streets so very shortly after you've paved them, end up with these large um, latitudinal cracks, or I guess that would be longitudinal cracks. You know, they're perpendicular to the drive lane. And it's, you know, it's pretty evident. It's, it's about every 10 to 20 feet you see one show up. And what happens is the concrete is expanding at a different rate right than the asphalt, asphalt is, okay. and it reflects through. And it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as they stay hairline cracks. But as soon as they don't, that's where we start seeing the, the alligators start happening. Um, and we do a fairly good job about going back and crack, crack sealing yeah. um, those block cracks. But we have, in several cases, ended up with a public relations issue because we've gone through, rehab this street, they have a brand new asphalt, and then two years later we come back and put crack seal on it so they see these black stripes on their street. And it's for the overall health of the street, but some people don't like the way that looks. I'm, I'm just curious if that con putting that concrete down would actually stop the the winter severity of the winter getting down into the subsurface because it basically would block it. I'm just curious <coughs> if that would help that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Some it's, of our problems have to do with the groundwater and the ability of the groundwater to move through the subsoil. 
And in some areas we've gone in and Johnny's put in French drains. That is true. On the, under the curb, you know, which has allowed some of the water then to, to escape from under the road. But you can see in a lot of our roads, you actually have water infiltrating through the pavement cracks because of the groundwater. Yeah, what about geotext? Geotext, I don't mean to be monopolized here and just tie you down. <laughs> I'm just, we we just... have used that in a few locations, okay. especially where we weren't able to stabilize. You know, it, it's we use we, that we, more into in a limited area. We haven't done a whole street. Okay. Just We just saw so many problems yes. this past, after this past thaw. Just... The good news is some of what we've seen is we think that, you know, was primarily you know, water getting in the cracks and asphalt failure, surface course failure, not necessarily, necessarily subgrade. Sub okay. And if that's the case and we can get that sealed up, we may be okay. okay. So, and we are focusing, like I said, um, Dixie Trail comes to mind because that is one that we noticed problems with. I don't think it's an, I don't think it's an exaggeration though to say that the winter this year to repair everything that was damaged would take your full budget and you would not touch a single street that we had planned on working on. That was probably a true statement. Barn Street's another one that I've noticed seems to be accelerating. And I don't know if it's from the winter or the traffic or what, but I've noticed that Barn Street, especially in the Sioux, that intersection area, that one seems to be accelerating also. The rating system you've people devised years ago it seems to me the conclusion on that is that with the level of funding we get from Powell Bill and given other city finance commitments we'll never get ahead and we'll right. fall further behind that's correct I mentioned before I mean why not put it to the people by the referendum for a some sort of increase on the sales tax for a limited period of time devoted to street yes. rehabilitation. Put it to a referendum. Let the people decide. Well, that also brings us to one of the budget notes from last week. You did ask us, uh, and the city attorney researched the issue of a local bill. The question was, please research how a local bill could be introduced which would establish a city-only sales tax with all proceeds going to road resurfacing within the city. The response that the city attorney gave was a six-page response. I have shortened that to one paragraph. <laughs> and and my, my synopsis of it is this. There are no legal impediments to a House or Senate member filing a local bill for state leg uh, with the state legislature. Therefore, a local bill could be filed for any local purpose, including road improvements. This would not be a bill for increasing the gas tax but rather a state, a, a sales tax increase. Additionally, the legislature has historically required a referendum of the voters to approve the increase. So, Mr. Bittner, the bottom line, John, is what? Talk to your, your legislator. <laughs> <laughs> and you could have a local bill, and it would be, if the referendum passed, then you could have it set up where all the proceeds of that part of the sales tax would go to road paving. There's a limitation on the amount of that sales tax, right, under statute. Is that not correct? That's why you'd have to go to the state legislature to get enabling legislation. I think it's one certain percent. We talked but, as, but as I recall, I think I think the county did it not too long ago, didn't they? And I, there have been other communities and counties that have <coughs> received permission to have a sales tax increase for their particular jurisdiction. Well, if you will recall, the last one was, I believe, a quarter cent sales tax that Onslow County received approval for with the proceeds going for emergency services, fire and ambulance work. And the city has not received any of that money, even though it is collected and paid by everyone countywide. Every time we have asked the fire commission to share that money with us, they have declined. Now, again, that was for a specific purpose, and you could, again, go to the state legislature, ask for a local bill, have a referendum, and have the people in the city only vote on it. Did you recall whether that had a sunset provision in it? 
I do I not believe it has a sunset provision because the funding continues to go to the volunteer fire districts on an annual basis. Okay. We will verify whether that has a sunset. One, one thing we talked about in previous budget years is that there is some additional charges that you can add to the vehicle registration that can be that a source of funding to fund both transit and uh, road uh, requirements. You know, local governments can vote to add up to a certain amount to the registration. It's five dollars. That's that's already in place, and and all. What would what would it take? Just the, the council make the decision as part of their budget. Yes. Uh, approvals. We will research that and bring you back more information. But it does not require a vote of the public. It is simply an action by the city council. And tell us how much that potentially could generate. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> I'll quickly run through the current project. I think a lot of these you probably know the status on, but um, starting with some of the facilities we have going, obviously the Sturgeon City Environmental Education Center is moving along <coughs> nicely. Our estimated completion date is December of this year. Um, the Jacksonville, Jacksonville Park and Ride facility, I think Anthony shared with you that we anticipate completion in June. Um, and then the transit multimodal is um, currently in design. Some of our wastewater, uh, our water and wastewater projects, um, the biofilter upgrades at Bremar and Ellis, as well as the Lagoon Curtain, in the, or the South Lagoon Curtain, is, are both in design. Henderson Drive infrastructure is um, ready to, or about ready to go to construction. I think we're getting ready to bid that out. And then the Indian Drive booster sh station is currently under construction, and um, as well as the chemical tank base repair. Actually, we're at 95% design on that. We, we're hoping to bid that in the next couple of weeks. Um, one of the things that we found there is um, some of the chemicals that we uh, were receiving as the truck was, you know, loading chemicals in the tank. Uh, just a little bit as they would disconnect or connect would run down the side of the tank and what we were finding is that it was actually damaging the concrete underneath so we're having to, to repair that. Um, Richard Ray Amphitheater looks beautiful. Anybody that hasn't been by there encouraged to go by. Um, we're hoping to have that completed very shortly. Um, facility of maintenance is currently working on the lighted bollards and the rail um, around the uh, detention pond um, or water feature, we'll say that, the water feature behind the stage. Um, Northeast Creek Park um, improvements is also moving along. We anticipate having that complete by Memorial Day. And then the um, Jacksonville Marina, the uh, contractor TD has just moved in a barge and they're uh, starting the pilings, and they have 86, is that correct? 80? I believe that's correct. Um, pilings to drive, and they need to have them done by the end of May because um, we have to be uh, out of the water work by the end of May. So if you get uh, complaints from people in my neighborhood about pounding headaches, <laughs> That's uh, why. They just have to deal with it for the next 60 days. <laughs> They'll be driving a lot of pilings. That's right. Um, some of the new projects, again, these are the um, uh, projects coming into the funding year. Um, the previous projects you'll see still have CIP because they are ongoing and we will expend money in FY19, but they're not new. Those are things you've previously approved. Um, the new projects... Um, the first one, you know, it could it could have gone into ongoing or it could be a new, but we have the Newbridge Street infrastructure, and I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a minute. Actually, I'll, I'll touch on the all of these um, in just a minute. But the, the Newbridge um, Street infrastructure, you know, we, we gave you a, an update on that. We have to install a new water line. The water line um, just isn't in good shape. We've had multiple problems out there. Um, the good news was the sewer was in good shape. 
um, but we need to upsize the stormwater lines. Um, and it also includes sidewalks, median, um, and streetscape improvements. And we started design this year of the total project. Um, and as this project moves forward, this is one you're going to see again. What I did is I included the funding sources as they're shown in the CIP. Um, but I think this is something that as we move forward, we're going to need to talk more about. So I think this is something you will see again, um, you know, especially as I point out the POW bill, you know, there's a large expenditure in POW bill. So there are some decisions that will need to be made there. Um, we've got at least three funding options and we will be looking at whether the project can be broken up into smaller phases. Um, and here's basically what I just said in words. The Decatur lift station elimination, um, currently there is a fairly small lift station that sits just off Decatur Road. Um, it's a it's a small station, but it's also a small wet well. Um, there, it's not submersible pumps; it's vacuum pumps. And one of the challenges we have is it sits right beside a creek, so we have very limited response time to the station. Um, it is not one that needs to be replaced and upgraded. It just needs to be, you know, upgraded, adding capacity. It just needs to be rehabilitated. And as we were doing our alternatives analysis, one of the things we realized is it may be possible to completely eliminate this lift station. Um, if you look at the lower end, and I'm not sure this is going to work, but I'm going to try, um, that green line is an existing outfall that goes to the Brookview lift station. It may be that we can follow the creek right along that creek with a gravity sewer and tie right into that existing outfall and completely eliminate that station, um, which is good because that would uh, reduce the operating cost, the manpower going out to check the station, but also the electrical cost of running the pump. So that's a actually a great project that we would like to see move forward. Um, I talked about this a little bit already, um, but the, I think the the good news is the new owners are uh, more than willing to work with the system, of course, uh, with the city. Of course, we have um, other uh, programs that we share with them, such as the pool. Um, so this is just a, a, you know, a great partnership. And one of the challenges we found, and you know, don't quote me on this, but I think the um, the I and I rates that we saw was somewhere in the 20 times range. So when we receive a heavy rainfall, we see basically 20 times the no normal flow through that system that we see on a dry day. So this is one that, um, although a small system, has a big impact. So we will be um, interested in hearing what the, the investigation firm comes out with and, and the recommend recommendations they share. And just as, as a reminder, a typical flow from Holiday City is about 40 to 50,000 gallons a day. Uh, heavy rain events we see anywhere from 400 to 500,000 gallons a day. I'm not so sure that's 20 times, but I'll let you do the math in public since Gail doesn't let me. I'm just going off what Greg told me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Bryn Mawr Force Main relocation, this is something that we talked to you at the last um, wastewater uh, this is something that will uh, eliminate other future projects that we may have to do, um, as well as possibly um, ease some of the um, sewer that's currently going to our um, land treatment site. And this is, I know you've seen this slide before, but essentially this project would redirect about 1.1 million gallons today. That equals around 20% of our um, wastewater collection system and it again it, there's at least three projects that by doing this we would not have to do in our current system can you five minutes I can try really hard okay try real hard. all right <laughs> so uh, our FY19 parks and rec projects um, we have Playground improvements at Wilson Bay and, sorry, I don't remember the other one, um, the Commons, thank you. 
Um, so this would be playground surfaces as well as uh, ADA um, upgrades. Um, the Barn Street, rec um, this is former Fire Station 2. This is a um, project to change this into a recreation center. And I have notes on that somewhere and I was going to share, but in five minutes I probably won't get it done. Um, but I think that you can find this on page 128 in your book. And the um, primary purpose there is to really uh, improve our wellness program and our activities that are available to citizens through uh, Nikki's uh, assistance. At least one city council member, primarily sitting on this side of the table, uh, <laughs> has certainly been a supporter of that program. But what we're doing there is retrofitting that building and turning it into an aerobics athletic type center. Wellness the, center. the biggest things we need are parking, sidewalks, landscaping, restrooms, flooring, and electrical upgrades. Sorry. And then the gateway signs. Um, our current signs need. Um, uh, to be replaced and those are at 17 North at Empire um, 17 South at Old Bridge, which is this sign um, 24 at Midway Park and then coming in gum branch from rich lands right there at the Duke Energy and then this project would also um, include smaller signs for other gateways into the city um, that currently doesn't have anything such as Montford Point Landing coming from the bypass Country Club Road coming in from Piney Green uh, Road, and then Carolina Force coming in from Ramsey. We don't have anything identified that you're entering the city in those locations. Future projects. Um, there's. A, can I stop you? Sure. Quick? I know we are, sir, you're only allocating a hundred thousand dollars for all this, huh? Um. That I is, that we it's on page addressed. 134. Hold on just a second. That does not include a lot of the TDA signs. Okay, okay. okay. I was going to say that you're not going to be able to accomplish that. <laughs> okay. It doesn't include any of the uh, the signs you're talking about, the commons. It doesn't include the signs for gateway finding. Yes, this is not the way finding. Let's see. Our future projects, we have three um, future water and sewer projects that we've identified. Um, aeration upgrades at um, LTS. Um, we are looking at a pilot program of doing the small, if you remember when we did the Blue Frog, um, the aeration trains consisted of six smaller ponds, four, or sorry, three very small ponds that had four aerators in them in front of larger ponds that had six aerators in them. We've done, we replaced all of the ponds that had the six aerators in them. So they had six 10 horsepower aerators in them. All of those have been replaced with the Blue Frog units. Um, we actually completed that this winter. So we're hoping as the weather starts warming up, they will see nice benefit from um, those units, especially in the way of sludge management and digestion. Um, but there's been some question of those units are such, are much easier to maintain than the current units that we have. They don't clog as frequently when they do. They're easy to clean. We can run them backwards. The maintenance is less. And there's some question of whether we could potentially do the four larger horsepower lagoons. So this would be the first portion of this project, phase three, would be to do one and try it out because we're not sure, you know, those are active mixing lagoons. We're not sure going with smaller horsepower will actually function the way it should. Um, and then should that work, then we would go with the second phase and replace the rest. Um, and then Poplar Branch pump station number two sewer. Um, we've got this identified in FY26. Um, it's in the Piney Green area. And I shared this with the um, Water and Sewer Advisory Committee. And we talked about one of the important, part of the importance of planning um, future improvements this far out is, you know, one of the places that we're looking at serving is out in the Patriot Park area. As you know, Patriot Park was annexed 
by Mr. Koenig, but has never moved forward. Um, well, by doing in a study of that area, what we've identified is that as Patriot Park develops out, we will need a pump station located in Patriot Park if we want to serve the larger area. So that's something that we can do as that project begins to develop out. I know I didn't do five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that coming. And then, um, of course, we could use it to reserve the easements for the gravity sewer to feed that station. So, and then our general fund projects, and I'll, I'll stop here, um, but we have the Piney Green Road landscape, the Northwoods recreation roof replacement, um, and you'll notice Jack Amiette's on there also. We've got some of those roofs are coming to the end of their useful life. Um, some have exceeded the end of their useful life, and we don't need to let those slip. So those are ones that we're starting to plan for now. On the Piney Green landscaping, that's actually going to be funded by the DOT. That is correct. We'll be doing the work. And there's a, a picture of much like we did on Huff Drive and Jacksonville. And skipping through, uh, one other one I didn't mention is we will also be going through, much like we do with our streets, um, and prioritizing and grading our parking lots. So we have programmed a project, although it, I, we threw up City Hall and the commons because those are two large parking parking lots that everybody's familiar with they may not be the first ones that we need to do obviously we have recreation center parking lots that are old um you know uh jackie Miette comes to mind and then um we also have some just parking lots in the downtown area that we may need to address and then one minute georgetown uh these are our recreation projects um, we'll be looking at a bathroom very similar to what we've done in um, this is our example that we're putting at Northeast Creek and at Jacksonville Landing. Um, the Commons multi-purpose facility, and I think this is one that we'll definitely be back to you to talk more about. Um, it's not, it's programmed for engineering in 21. But and Susan could do a much better job than I could at this. But basically, from what I understand, the commons and our other rec centers are booked essentially 100% of the time they're available to be booked. Did I say that? Sounds good. All right. Um, Let's go back on that one one second. Sure. We're currently talking to uh, John Sawyer, who's an architect that we worked with before, to bring you a report that will actually show you for the amount of money that. Uh, people are, let me say it differently, we are looking at projects that have been built in the last three years in this part of the state so you can get an idea of what projects cost. That's a combination of a study relative to the TDA funding as well as city funding. And we hope that uh, probably in August we'll bring that report to you and the TDA so you can see that if you want, if you have this much money, this is what you can build. If you want something bigger, then you have to find more money. Look forward to that in August. And that one's on page 138. Uh, Kerr Street and Phillips Park were both constructed over pre-regulated landfills. I think we've talked about that before. You know, I think it's important to mention again, they're safe. You know, they, they have been, um, they've been closed, but in order for us to do any further redevelopment, those are things that we're going to have to come back and visit. So um, we have program money to look at that. Um, some of that cost can be recovered from the state. So um, some of that is eligible for reimbursement. And then um, a miracle field, basically, um, this would be for the special needs population. Um, it's a an improved surface. Um, my, I think in some cases I've seen them rubber. In some cases I've seen something more like a astroturf type. But um, this is programmed in FY 24, so this is a ways out there. But um, there is a large special needs population. I work, you know, this is one near to my heart because I work with Jazza and I coach for their top soccer program. And it's interesting to see the number of kids that come out. And then another multi-purpose 
uh, recreational complex. This is essentially mirror to the one I just showed you at the Commons, um, but it's programmed in FY26, which is um, in year eight of our capital improvement plan. And this would be located somewhere other than at the Commons. Um, the location yet to be identified. And then obviously the picture is not representative, but um, in FY28, there is planning for um, community pool uh, with location to be identified. And that would be obviously based off usage and need. Well, they did a great job. What I'd focus your attention to in your capital improvement book, uh, if you will look on pages 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, that's really what we want you to focus on, not tonight, but in the, in the days ahead. This shows you those projects that are proposed for FY19 and so forth. When you adopt your budget, we will, we will be asking you to let us know do you want to modify anything in these schedules, because when you adopt the budget, we'll also be asking you to adopt the 19 fiscal year 19 spending plan for capital improvements. Any questions at this point? Okay, nice job, Wally. Thank you very much, Wally. Thanks, Wally. Good job. All right, any, uh, anything else? How about a motion to adjourn? All those in favor? All right. All right.